Welcome to this edition of Partners for Community Living. I'm Judy Lazier and I'm pleased to be your host. Uh, let me give you a little background if you're joining us for the first time about Partners for Community Living. We are the partnership between Resident Home Association and Choices in Community Living, uh, two of our region's most respected uh, residential providers. And I may say, without any uh, too much of uh, hyping here, probably two of the most respected agencies of their kind in the state of Ohio as well. We provide services for people with developmental disabilities, and that ranges from uh, a range of home uh, home options in the community to adult daycare day services to respite services, non medical transportation. Um, and through partners, we have a, a many services, volunteer program, and some fundraising efforts, and some things you've probably heard about in the community. I want to just take a moment to to ask you to put on your your parent hat or your grandparent hat or your aunt or uncle hat or something, and think of think of a family unit that um, maybe maybe there's three children in your family, and of those three children. Um, you have set up a, an entire plan to make sure that their future is taken care of. You've taken two of them and you've set up a savings plan for them. Not only have you set up a savings plan for them, you've been one of the wise people that uh, steps forward and gets their plan giving in, in all set up for yourselves for, for a time uh, when you'll need it. You'll get your will taken care of and, and maybe a trust if that's the case. And two of your children are included in your will or they're included in your plan giving, whatever that may be, a, a trust or an annuity or something. And maybe two of your children are included as beneficiaries on your life insurance policy. And then along comes somebody that doesn't know you and they hear that you have three children and two of your children you've taken care of. Their futures will be taken care of. There will be money for college or perhaps to help them with a home or to do whatever they need to do with what you're going to be able to, to, to ensure for them. And then there's that one child that had no such resource from you. And imagine what a stranger may think of you as a parent when they know that about you. For too long in this community and across Ohio and across the nation, that was just the dilemma that faced families who had children with developmental disabilities. Because of the way our system was set up, because of the way our funding mechanisms were set up, you could not ensure a child with a developmental disability. You could not put a child with a developmental disabilities as one of your beneficiaries in your will unless you risk that child losing their Medicaid status and therefore the funding that would provide their services throughout their life. That, that's been the dilemma facing too many people for too many years. And so that's why this program tonight is something that is uplifting to me and I hope it will be uplifting to you if you're a family member or you have a neighbor or someone with a developmental disability or um, if you're someone that's been thinking, you know, what do families like that, what, what options do they have? Uh, you know, you feel, I don't want to feel sorry for them, but what, what is there out there in this community that can possibly help them the way we're able to help our, our children? And so we're, I'm pleased to invite, uh, introduce our two guests tonight, and we're going to talk about s just a couple of the resources that are here and a couple of the changes that have been made over the past few years that has at least not, it's not ended all of those concerns, but it's certainly made a big impact in, in families. And I would like to introduce Pete Roll, who many of you have seen before if you've been a part of our program. Uh, Pete is the executive director of one of the agencies I talked about, Resident Home Association, uh, that will be celebrating their 50th. 50th in 2016. In 2016. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see why they're one of the most respected agencies, along with the quality of services they provide. And next to him is a newer face, and maybe some of, uh, some of you have seen him in other places, I'm sure, and that's Mr. Kevin Hayde. And he's, he's got a broad shoulders here tonight because he's got agencies on both shoulders here that we're going to be talking about. And he'll be representing the Brighter Tomorrow Foundation and he'll be representing the Disability Foundation. 
And so let's let's get going. If if people are new to us and all, and we're talking about developmental disabilities, let's define just overall in general. What do we mean when we say a developmental disability? Well, when you're talking about a person with a developmental disability, you're talking about someone in most cases was born with a disability such as Down syndrome, autism, spina bifida, um, cerebral palsy, and when people are born with those disabilities. They need an extra level of support to, to get through their lives. Um, and that's where agencies like Resident Home and Choices come in. Um, we work with the families. Eventually, we end up working with the individuals. And we try to support them and help them you know, establish and then have their dreams fulfilled, whether it's living independently, whether it's you know, living with some other people, um, making sure they can go to work, they can play, they can do the same things that all of us want to do, um, but sometimes with just a little extra more support. And Kevin, you uh, highlight just a little bit the, what defines a developmental disability. We, we got the, the terms mm -hmm. and all, but as far as the age and the permanency of the disability and those things. Well, and, and to kind of clarify too, the, the Disability Foundation, you know, going back to the, the two hats that I wear, um, works with individuals with all disabilities as defined by the Social Security Administration. Um, and certainly with uh, the developmental disabilities is probably 60, 70 percent of the families or individuals that we work with. Um, Briar Tomorrow Foundation is specifically, uh, those grants are specific to organizations that provide those supports that Pete was referring to. Um, so we are part of kind of that those those cogs or part of the a small part of those projects um, when it comes to assisting uh, individuals with de uh, developmental disabilities in Montgomery County. And we're so. looking at people that the the what we're talking about is a disability that's lifelong, mm -hmm. that's um, and so permanent in Chronic, nature, yes. and that usually occurs before the age of twenty-two and that has, has an impact, as Pete says, on the ability to, to do daily, act, daily life activities that most of us in, a, in too many ways take for granted, you know, the, the getting Correct. around and doing, having a job and taking care of ourselves and those kind of things. Um, and I think we're, I'd like to start with, since I know a little bit about the Brighter Tomorrow Foundation, I've heard of, heard of it a few years <laughs> here and all, let's talk about <clears throat> to give a background of uh, what Brighter Tomorrow Foundation is and how, how it got started. Okay. <clears throat> the Brighter Tomorrow Foundation was created out of um, a couple of generous donors who wanted to uh, assist primarily individuals with developmental disabilities residing in Montgomery County. So through their gifts, and this was in 1989, they made gifts to help not just adults but children um, with developmental disabilities the Briar Tomorrow Foundation was formed out of those two primary gifts, and a grant program was created uh, to provide those gifts to those organizations that had projects that were going to provide those supports. Um, in 2008, um, the Briar Tomorrow Foundation came under the auspices of the Dayton Foundation. Um, the primary reason was um, to share resources, but to also save money that may was, maybe was going to their expenses or their overhead, um, and the primary benefit was that you know twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand dollars, which in the big picture is maybe not a, a, a great big number, but those those funds go directly to grants now. So you have extra funds going to instead of keeping the lights on um, for an office space, they are going directly to grant projects. So that's the the primary role. We have a um, an annual uh, grant program, so we we have we provide um, grants one time per year, and actually our 2016 grant cycle is coming up. November 6th is our deadline for um, applications to be turned in. Um, so it's from that point, it's a three-month review process, and uh, beginning of February, um, the checks actually go out to those organizations to help support those projects. And so you provide grants to organizations, not to individuals. Correct, correct. They have to be a 501c3 organization. Their primary mission has to be to assist um, individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and they have to be certainly um, an, an innovative 
project, maybe that is, that's too general of a term. Um, basically, we are, um, we always like to refer to ourselves as the little engine that could. So we don't have, a, a, you know, a lot of um, big donations or big grants that are going out. Um, but we want to make sure that we're making the greatest impact with the gifts that are, that are being made. Um, so we certainly are, are uh, uh, sticking to um, those collaborations with organizations such as Pete um, and the numerous um, organizations that support people with developmental disabilities in Montgomery County. And it is Montgomery County? Correct. Uh, Correct. Agencies. And that's sp specific to the donor request, mm -hmm. so that's why it's uh, specific to Montgomery County. And you have uh, three to four focus areas where you provide grants. Sure, um, and our and we it goes one to four as far as our priorities. Um, housing is the first priority. Lasting equipment is the second. Um, education is the third, and recreation is the fourth. So typically, we get um, anywhere up to three times the grant dollars requested as we're able to gift every year um, or to grant every year. Um, when it gets to that point, we start at our number one priority, which is housing. And then lasting equipment, that includes um, lifts for wheelchairs, wheelchairs themselves, um, vans that are wheelchair accessible, for example, um, education, um, parenting programs for uh, parents who are new to a situation where they uh, now have a child with a, a developmental disability, um, and recreation, uh, playgrounds, things like that um, it would be the fourth priority. Um, our goal is to try and gift or grant funds to as many worthy projects as possible. Um, sometimes the, the funds aren't available like we'd like them to be, but um, we certainly try and hit all those four areas um, because those are the four areas that um, the donors had concentrated on or that they had um, made their focus when they um, helped to create the Briar Tomorrow Foundation. And it started in 19... 1989. 1989, yeah. so it has a few years under its belt yes, as well. <laughs> Can, um, and we don't need an exact number or anything, but just off the top of your head, can you uh, give an idea of, of how much money has been given out to this community and grants through Brighter Tomorrow? Over 642000 So that's spread over um, about 126 grants over, you know, that, that entire period. Um, initially, a lot of the um, grants went to housing. Um, initially, it was to... Uh, maybe to r remodel or renovate um, residential group homes. Um, and then as the shift went to supported living, it went to helping to make um, accessible some of those residents for um, individuals that might be um, utilizing a wheelchair or a walker, have some difficulty getting around their home. Um, and then really the projects are kind of all over. Um, it's really as creative as the organizations can be to try and get the most bang for their buck, let's say. And Pete, your, your agency has certainly been a recipient of the uh, generosity of that foundation. Mm -hmm. You want to highlight uh, just a couple of the things? Well, that... there, there's, been, there's been many over the years. Um, you know, Kevin talked about accessible vans, um, really a, a big deal for us because you know, there's not a mechanism in place to, to fund vans. Um, so when we, and, and we take people to work we take people on social outings, go to a Reds game, go to go downtown to see a play. And when you don't have vehicles, or if your vehicles get old and in disrepair, it's hard to make those things happen for people. So one of the nice things the Disability Foundation has done is they help us help others. Um, and they do it through a lot of different ways. Transportation would be one thing, but we've had special programs where you know we hire a staff person to put um, different activity schedules together, whether it's art classes or pottery or other, other things like that. And through the grants from, from the Disability Foundation. The Bride we've of actually, Tomorrow, yeah. Bride, I'm sorry, the yeah, Bride right. of Tomorrow Foundation. We've actually been able to buy supplies to make those classes happen. So they're not paying for personnel. They're not paying for us to keep our lights on, but they help us with supplies and things that help enrich the lives of the people that we serve. So we've had that, we've had homes remodeled, um, we've had bathroom projects, all sorts of different things. Um, and had it not for, been for the Brighter Tomorrow Foundation, you know, we'd be scrambling to figure out a way, how are we going to 
keep our homes, keep our, um, our clients in a, in, a, in a state where they want to be. Um, and so the help, you know, Kevin said that they've been a small cog, but actually they've been a very vital cog for, for the mission that we have and with choices in community living as well. They're, they're, um, we've come to depend on some of those things and we know we have to share with others. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we will always ask when we think we have something that's worthwhile and, and they always listen to us. They don't always give us what we need or what we want, but they really try to help and they have made a big difference. And it, it's the thing of uh, just, you know, as you say, the, the money that you get doesn't provide all the needs. And I'm always struck by when you look at Brighter Tomorrow and the Disability Foundation and our agencies and all. We've talked here and we've used the words enhancing services and all, but adding to the quality of life. It just seems like none of we didn't all get together and sit down and say, let's make that the underpinning right. of what we're doing, but it just seems like if you're doing what we're doing, right. whichever end of it it is, that's the end game for everyone, is that, you know, what do we do to to do that quality of life? And sometimes that means being able to go go out and, you know, get a block of tickets to go to the Dragons or right. something that, that they've never got to do or something. And well, and to, to Pete's point, too, you know, we talk about um, community inclusion. Well, without a way to get into the community, you know, you think the van, that's a vital part. I mean, if you can't, you can't be a part of your community if you can't get into the community. So those are the things that, you know, our grants committee, our, uh, the Briar Tomorrow Foundation Board looks at um, when we start to prioritize things that are important, you know, and that's, that's why, you know, lasting equipment is as high as it is on our priority list. Um, because if you can't, um, if you don't, if you can't pay for a ramp into your home, um, it's kind of hard to live in a home when you can't get into it. So uh, these things that, you know, maybe passerbys um, don't really uh, look at as kind of a vital need, um, we do. And we understand that those needs are there. And the funding's not necessarily available through other funding sources. Um, so we certainly try and help out as, as, as much as we can. Well, I know I can speak from the mm -hmm. choices perspective that uh, under one, I don't know if it was the year before or maybe the year before that or something, we, Choices received a grant from the Brighter Tomorrow Foundation that provided an extensive amount of uh, new furniture mm -hmm. for homes. That uh, Choices was able to upgrade beds and kitchen tables and new sofas mm -hmm. and even uh, one gentleman that had trouble getting out of a, a regular armchair right. or something, uh, we were able to get him one of those nice recliners that you push right. the button and he, and he could stand right up, right. you know, without uh, having to have staff come over and try to get him up out of there or something. And the freedom that gave him right. in his own home yeah. to be able to get up and everything. So, so it's those kind of things that, like you say, that just add to the quality of life that, right. uh, that certainly the people that we serve don't have that money and agencies like Resident Home and Choices don't have that money. It, that has to be spent on making sure they're safe and that the home's right. running and all those kind of things. So, um, and I believe, um, you know, I don't know for sure, you'd probably be, know this better, but I think, isn't Brighter Tomorrow the only one that specifically gives to people with developmental disabilities, as, you know, as a granting source in, in Montgomery, Montgomery County. County. Correct. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, there, there are others like the Dayton Foundation that right. will also, but you're in competition with all the other needs correct. in the community as well, but specifically. Um, do, you, do you accept, you, you talked about the, you know, the, the, the big endowment and people look at something like a, a, a disab disability or Brighter Tomorrow or the Dayton Foundation and they think, oh, well, that's really wealthy people. Right. That's what support this. But but do you accept donations and smaller gifts and things to keep sure. yourself building that endowment? Yeah, and we, you know, no gift is too small, no gift is too big. Um, but it's really um, part of the the benefit that we find. And, you know, Pete, you can, Judy, you can attest to the same. Um, a, a $5 gift is another member of your organization's committee or, or community, uh, mm -hmm. your, your family. So it helps to kind of grow your um, community outreach with every, you know, kind of uh, relationship that you can build with donors. Um, so we, we certainly um, take um, 
sort of a three-pronged approach and it includes small donations, corporate donations, and uh, um, planned giving. Any of uh, our parents, any of, any of our grandparents um, that may be interested in including the Briar Tomorrow Foundation as, um, as a ways to, uh, to be philanthropic after they're gone. Um, we certainly try and have those conversations too. Um, part of the bonus being gifts to us mean gifts to other organizations. So it's, it's, we are spreading, spreading the wealth, I guess, yes, is, yeah. is, for lack of a better way to describe right. it, is, is a good way that we, we kind of approach uh, potential donors. So. And who makes the decision on, I, I, know the, I know the process for getting the grants in and the agencies and uh, all the groups, you know, getting their applications in in a timely manner and all that, but how's that process? Is, is that you that makes that decision or how's the decision for whatever funds you have available that, that year to give out? How does, how does that work? We have a grants committee and it's made up of board members and um, volunteer members of the communities, um, all who have some sort of um, uh, service ex experience uh, working with uh, people with disabilities, um, primarily in Montgomery County, and who have a an understanding of the barriers that organizations have, some of the programs that are available out there. Um, so the Grants Committee reviews all of the grants, um, and they, they review them, and after a few weeks, they get back together and re-review them, and then they, they make a recommendation to the board um, as to which grants that they would like to have um, given out um, for the upcoming year. And it's the board's final decision as to the grants that, are, that, uh, that go out. And the board also determines, uh, based of, upon our, our budgetary situation, how, mu how much of those funds can go out. Um, and that they sort of work hand in hand with the grants committee to ensure that we're maximizing uh, the grants that are going out every year. And there is an evaluation process, so there is accountability. Sure. That you're that you're clear that uh, the, the, whatever donations are, are being sent out. Sure. That from people that have donated to you are being well spent and yeah, and, well and, managed. And, and they have, um, you know, as a part of that review process, there is a scoring um, uh, a process that we utilize to make sure that we're being fair and that it. It covers all the areas of the grants uh, focus on making sure it meets the mission and it's one of the four criteria. And then um, at the end of the, the grant year, um, which would be in October, so October of 2016 will be the, the end of the grant year for our 2016 grants, um, we receive a final report from the organization. Um, it's it's a, a check and balance to ensure that the money that went out was utilized for the specific purpose, but it also helps us to see the impact that we're making. Um, part of um, what we're doing too and is hopefully being a good partner to um, the, the other providers, the other support agencies in the area. Um, and, and part of that way that we can, we can communicate that is to give examples of some of the projects that, um, that we've been involved with. Once again, we're involved in a, a small uh, in a small way. The the RHAs, the partners, the choices, the other organizations, uh, We Care Arts. Those are the organizations that are doing the work and they're doing the hands-on um, supports for for people to help enhance their lives. But um, we like to think that we're just a small small part of the of the su the successes that they're having. Well, mm. I know um, certainly partners in our agencies were very pleased because. Something as important to us as the less we forget film and audio documentaries. Yeah. Writer Tomorrow was there yeah. as a, as a partner with that, to, and that's in worldwide <clears throat> distribution oh, yeah. now. That's still being sold to this day in Canada and all over the you know the United States, colleges all over the country. Yeah. And Brighter Tomorrow had they were there in mm -hmm. partnership with uh, with all you know the other right. people that uh, said yes, this is a, this is a good thing that we need to do. And yeah. and I know you're there every year supporting. The, Hall, the Developmental Disabilities Hall of Fame. Correct. You do a very special arts festival, Correct. which is yeah. uh, which is a wonderful event in itself. The first Friday of May mm -hmm. every year that provides accessible arts experiences for people from what, what is it, seven or eight counties now, and it come in the region. It's regional. Yeah. So. And, and Montgomery County Board, they have the not just the Aaron Ritchie, but they have a whole um, program a project to to help educate the community on what developmental disabilities um, encompasses and what some of the, 
the uh, projects that are out there, the services that are available, and they um, explain what the need is. I, I think a lot of people out in the community um, who don't have direct exposure um, to someone with a disability or the organizations that serve those individuals, um, they may not fully appreciate the need that's out there. Um, and that's one way that the, that the county board helps to um, educate the community. So we're involved with uh, funding that project every year. And we think that's really important. Well, as we wrap up this this hat, okay. I mean, we can <laughs> certainly come back to it and all, but mm -hmm. can uh, uh, give us a phone number and um, a web address. I, I'm assuming uh, you have a website where people, if they if they want to find out about making a planned gift or if they want to sure. make a donation or something, they can get on your website. Yeah. So uh, you want to give us your phone number and a website. Sure. It's uh, brightertomorrowfoundation.org. Um, and I'll give my direct line. Um, it's 937-225-9939. Um, that's for both uh, the next hat <laughs> and, and for this hat. Um, it's just, it's, it, it gets me directly and it helps me answer questions quicker. So, okay. so certainly, uh, I think Pete and I would both uh, say to anyone that did have an interest, it's a certainly uh, someplace where the money is well spent and maximized and, and given back to that quality of life. Absolutely, and greatly appreciated. And greatly appreciated. And uh, Pete, just for a minute, talk about, especially people with developmental disabilities, what fun, how, how they receive money through me the Medicaid system. Well, most of the people that we serve are on Medicaid, and they qualify for Medicaid based on, on their resources, or in this case, lack thereof. Um, so you're not talking about people with a lot of money. They're usually on, on fixed income, so they have Social Security benefits. They might have SSI. They might have some income from, from work, um, but their resources are rather small. Um, and when you're on a waiver, uh, the waiver buys the services that you receive from a provider such as Resident Home. So if I'm a person with a disability, I can select a provider, and based on what my needs are, I can you know, select resident home or choices, and I use that waiver to buy services. It basically buys for the, the care of the staff that take care of me. But then there's other things out there. So my resources in that waiver help, help, my, help me put a roof over my head. Um, they help somebody help me. Um, but then, you know, there's... Sometimes there's extra money. Okay, maybe a person will have, like in our case, if you have a room and board situation where your room and board comes up to $700 a month, but your benefits come up to $1,000 a month. Well, something to say, in that scenario, there's $300 left. It's not a lot of money, but over a period of time, that money can build up. And in the food stamp situation, if you have $1,500 worth of saved money, you get over that amount, you know, you can lose your food stamp. I think with, um, with Medicaid and Social Security benefits, you save above $2,000, and then those benefits become in jeopardy. So basically, your whole support system, you know, is in jeopardy if you have too, much, too many assets. So a good way for people to use some of that money is to put it into a trust, a trust with the Disability Foundation where they can still access those funds for services and, and items that their other benefits don't pay for. Um, so it's a way to shelter some of that money, basically save it for a rainy day. So if you want to go, you know, if you want to go out to eat occasionally, if you have a special trip, if maybe you have some special shoes or glasses or dental care that your Medicaid benefits don't cover, all those things are, are now possible if you can save your resources. So there's a way to save those resources um, without jeopardizing your benefits. And so it's, uh, it's a very important um, avenue to help people. Well, we talked at the beginning of the program about how, you know, generations of families, even people that you're still serving at Resident Home Association, their families, there was no option for, for many years. It was that Medicaid cutoff, and, and that was it. I mean, once you, and if you got any more in there, they had to do spin down mm -hmm. and, and not have that in there or risk. And there is a line in on your, uh, the Disability Foundation website that I really think captures it so well, and it talks about that uh, through me the Medicaid as, as 
good as that is in providing to make sure that people are safe and that they have a roof over their head and, and all, but to be eligible for Medicaid requires impoverishment, mm -hmm. which I think is just, a, it's just something that it says about how we may want to treat right. people or accept people that are part of our community and our family or something, that to, to be eligible for this, you must be impoverished. Right. And, you know, I can look back and I can look at two people right here and people that I've worked with over the years that have worked many, many years to work to get these kind of, this kind of a trust right. set up. It was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Right. It had to go through all kinds of federal things and state. And I must admit, there's, there's still confusion to me about this pooled thing over here <laughs> and this went into a pooled over here and everything. But... Uh, Give us, give us the back. That's a little bit of the history that okay. it, it, it too has not been that long since right. the Disability Foundation. So it's still there, ready to grow and ready to accept new people and all. But give us background on the Disability Foundation. And sure. you did mention that it does serve people with disabilities in general, right. not just people with developmental disabilities. Right. Um, part of you know going along with um, some of the information you've already shared. Um, is that a lot of families had to exclude their child uh, just because they had a disability from their long-term financial plans, including their estate plans, their wills. Um, a lot of times the system would um, encourage parents or grandparents to disinherit that child just because they had, they had a disability. So already in the system, when you talk about the system um, sort of um, impoverishing people or making sure that they stay impoverished, um, the system was also um, unequal. There was inequity built into the system. You have three children, you have one with a, uh, a, a disability and two children without disabilities. Um, automatically, the system, the legal system, wanted to treat that child differently than the other two. Um, so I'm not sure what it would be like to go um, disinheriting your child is a formal procedure. I mean, you go to court, it's a whole, and, and basically say you have no ownership but no responsibility for this child, um, you know, no matter what the age. And um, we've known families that have had to do I, that. I've, yeah. I've been in living rooms with parents mm -hmm. who would just break down and cry yeah. with, at the thought of having to do that. Um, it's, it's just, it's hard, it's hard to explain if you haven't seen it. Right. But if you can imagine for any one of your kids saying, you know, well, you two are okay, but I can't, I can't help you. Right. To the third, it's, it's a situation nobody should have to be in. Right. They really shouldn't. Yeah, and so thankfully, right. there's this alternative, especially here. Now, is the Disability Foundation just in Montgomery County, this particular Disability Foundation, or does it serve a broader community? We can serve anybody in the state of Ohio. Oh, anybody. Yeah. So really, because of those scenarios, the disinheriting a, a child or grandchild, um, the interpretations of different states over special needs trusts, um, there are a number of kind of precedents or court cases that uh, led up to um, it's the OBRA um, Act of 1993. It created a lot of these, um, the IO waiver, the OBRA waiver, a lot of the, the Medicaid waivers you hear about. Um, also included in that was um, the ability to create, um, we, we refer to them as D4C trusts, but they're pooled disability trusts. And, its primary mission, and our primary mission with the Disability Foundation, is to help preserve those government benefits that may be capped benefits. Uh, Medicaid's 1500 Social Security is um, 2000 or um, any kind of HUD assistance that you're getting, um, which is based upon your, your income and your, your asset level. Um, with our trust, you can place whatever funds they might be. The individual themselves can, can uh, fund the trust, a parent, a grandparent, or someone ordered by the court, so a legal guardian, for example, um, and any funds that are held within that trust don't count against those um, asset caps, those $1,500 and $2,000. Um, so the benefit for families is now you can include all three children in your, your plans. Um, you can name the Disability Foundation as the beneficiary um, for that individual with the funds going to the benefit of that person. So you become a middleman. Correct. In, in, yeah. in a way. Yeah, and yeah. part of the what we do is um, we are a protection 
um, that's in place for that individual, uh, we make sure that any funds that uh, go out of the trust that are utilized for the sole benefit of that individual, um, they have to be utilized for supplemental needs, so they can't pay for anything that's already paid for um, uh, basic necessities, so housing, um, your rent, your mortgage, uh, groceries for the home, utilities, um, or any um, costs that are the responsibility of Medicaid, medical costs in particular, um, then the trust can pay for them. And so when we talk about uh, enhancing people's lives, enriching people's lives, this is one of the tools that um, families or individuals can utilize to pay for things that aren't covered. You know, Pete had talked about the budget items um, that are included um, as, a, as a part of someone's uh, uh, total funding um, that are responsible for covering the health and safety and the shelter and uh, making sure that there's transportation. Um, this allows uh, families to make plans for someone and it covers a wide range. Um, even though there are some restrictions, it's not a restrictive product. Um, it covers clothing, uh, cable TV, uh, pay for your cell phone, the, um, it, vacations. I mean, it covers really the gamut of um, uh, memberships to the YMCA. It, it could cover whatever those things are. I get asked a lot, what do people typically utilize it, um, those funds on? And it would be whatever you and I would spend our money on f as entertainment or uh, <coughs> making sure whatever makes us happy, uh, tickets to Reds games or Dragons games, whatever it might be. Um, so part of our responsibility, and we are a middleman, we are considered the distribution trustee for those trusts. We make sure that any funds coming in are from the appropriate source, individual, parent, grandparent, um, and that any funds that are coming out of the trust um, meet the definition of a supplemental need so that we're not putting the Medicaid or Social Security in So Pete can't that go in and bill for <laughs> the, the direct care uh, right. from, to, from, from the state and from uh, somebody exactly. else as well. I think you're right. trying to set me up. Oh. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and part of what we do is in working with uh, some of the, uh, the service organizations, um, they serve, often they serve um, a vital role in what we do. Um, we have, each trust has to have a personal representative. Um, some people may have recognized like representative payee, that's somebody who is in charge of someone's social security, for example. Um, we can't act as the personal representative. That, the, that person has authority or has the authorization to make um, requests from the trust. Um, it's a conflict of interest for us to be um, to fulfill that role. And really our preference is that somebody that knows the individual, the trust recipient, um, takes on that role. And a lot of times uh, residential providers, they're, um, uh, someone on their staff, a benefits coordinator, um, an SSA for example, will take on that role to ensure that the individual is able to utilize their trust and utilize their trust funds. Because um, on the flip side, we also have to have an accounting for mm -hmm. funds that are spent. So in case Medicaid, Social Security want to know, they want to ensure that the funds are being spent appropriately, we can match up invoices and, the right person and is receipts. Getting them, Correct. Not the pay right. or someone that. Correct. Or if you had that indep independently on their own, that right. could happen. Uh, you know, most people are very caring, but there there could be people that right. might take advantage of that or yeah. something. So, so they, you can uh, establish one of these trusts during your lifetime. Um, you get um, a, uh, an, a payment due from Social Security, a prorated amount. They should have been paying you X over X number of years, um, and they they give you a large lump sum of money. You have a limited amount of time to spend those on appropriate expenses or allowable expenses. Um, and instead of just having to spend money to spend it, um, you can place that um, in a trust and you can utilize it as you wish to utilize it. Or you can um, uh, fund a trust through your life insurance or your general estate um, and you can uh, make that as a part of your estate planning. So we work with financial advisors, estate planning attorneys, uh, families directly, certainly, um, and we, we hope that we are providing um, when people are doing their futures plans and they're making their long term, which covers the vocational and the, the education, the residential, and all the different aspects. We are just one component. We are just one of the tools as a part of that financial bubble um, that hopefully we're, we're uh, providing um, a useful tool f for those families. So 
they don't have to worry about you know what's going to happen to to those individuals and once again being a part of the Dayton Foundation um, the Dayton Foundation has been a part of the community since 1921 um, you know 50 years from now I probably won't be in the position the Dayton Foundation, the Dayton Foundation will be there, will be there. Yeah. and you know they can make those long-term plans um, and that's uh, they we follow all of their investment policies so there's lots of checks and balances to make sure that we're stewarding their funds someone who's worked their lifetime to create um, um, a certain amount of wealth for example um, they want to make sure that whoever they're turning those funds over to are going to be responsible um, and so since we are we are considered a supporting organization of the Dayton Foundation so we report to them they uh, they make sure that we are meeting of all, all of our benchmarks and doing what we're supposed to do and that's uh, that's comforting for families seems like it's just the most rational logical thing that should have been there and to think back on the struggles that it took to right. to get and it's just like oh that was really simple but it it really wasn't very simple and, uh, well and it can be really labor intensive for families um, instead of because you could create a trust um, and then have a family member act as the trustee and be in charge of reporting any of those expenditures to uh, the court or Social Security or Medicaid, um, keeping an eye on investments, um, uh, watching out for making sure the distributions are going out according to the rules, making sure they know the rules. Um, instead of that, you can come to us and we do all that for you because it can be uh, rather, like I said, labor intensive. And um, family members want to help, um, but they don't want it to be a burden either. And this takes that burden off of them. The responsibility, the liability lies with us, but they still maintain control of the account because they are the personal representative to the trust. And I know you've had, <clears throat> had some people that have trusts. Oh, absolutely. That really changed their lives. I, there's one person in particular that just you know, tickles my heart, just brings a smile to my face, even, even though she's no longer here. And mm -hmm. that would be Mary. Mm -hmm. and, and Mary's sister did some planning. Um, and, and she had... She had some money left from uh, a retirement fund that, you know, from the state of Michigan, and she she made this money available to Mary, and it went into a trust with the Disability Foundation. And if you knew Mary, Mary had she, she liked the finer things in life, so she liked to go to the opera, she liked to go to the theater, and she liked to include her family with this. She liked to travel, and because of the Disability Foundation, she was able to enjoy some of the very things that the rest of her family enjoyed, except now she got to do it too. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't held against her. So she could have tickets to the opera. And when she would go to the opera, she wouldn't just go to the opera. She would go out for, a, for dinner beforehand. They would go to the show. They might go out for a coffee and, and dessert afterwards, and she would come home. Um, she would go for, you know, in, in, in the colder months. She would escape... <laughs> what we would all like to escape yes, here, definitely. and she would go to Arizona, or she would go to Florida, or, right. or she'd been to Spain and Italy right. uh, over over time, and you know it was just it was everything that the family wanted that money to go for, mm -hmm. and the happiness that it brought her is something you can't measure. She mm -hmm. would talk about it. She would have pictures. She would tell you just small little intimate details about what they had at this restaurant and how much, you know, that her, her relatives enjoyed it and the smiles on their faces. So, you know, through, the, through that donation from her family, you know, not only was she able to benefit, but she could take a companion. And usually the companion was a family member. And because of that, it was, it had, you know, it meant the world to her. And we all live vicariously through and, there. Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and she was such a lady. She was. she was. She was such a refined lady. And the thing is, people might say, well, that money should have gone and, you know, Medicaid shouldn't have had to pay for her, her home or anything. But it wasn't that kind of money. It was enough money to allow her right. to do those kind of things. If she'd have had to pay for her home and all those kind of things, that money would have depleted in no time and then she wouldn't have been Medicaid eligible and she would have faced the last years of her life without any support. Well let me give you a story on the other side of that. We have somebody that has lived with us for probably 40 years and her family owned land down by the Dayton Mall and so for the first 25 years of her existence with us 
she was a private pay. So all that time she was praying, paying privately until the money was gone. They, there was a trust that was set up for her, mm -hmm. but it wasn't through the Disability Foundation. It was, it was a trust that was held by a bank and, and you know, when it was time to pay her per diem or, or buy clothing or food and her, her, her portion of that, we would build the trust and they would give us money. But, um, and, and she, she's still with us too. She's 90 years old now, um, born on the 4th of July. But anyway, she, she, for the longest time, it was, it was strictly private pay. And that money could have been used differently, um, although I dare say it, it wasn't. And she still has had a marvelous life with us. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it could have been done differently, but those vehicles weren't available at the time that the, pla the family um, set up the trust and decided that, you know, we really wanted to give her a chance to be independent of the family. Um, so one of those things that, you know, because of when she was born, and, and her lifespan wasn't quite available to her like it was to Mary. Well, and the good thing, too, about the trust is that because it's for supplemental needs, you're not paying for anything that's already being taken care of. Right. And, you know, we, we kind of uh, circle back to our impoverishment uh, uh, discussion earlier. Um, this system, you know, without certain avenues for families, the system is really uh, designed to keep individuals impoverished. Um, so when you want to make some sort of long-range plans for yourself, whether it's recreation or, um, you know, how your house is going to look. Mary was such a, a, she had so many neat examples. She sent herself flowers every week. You know, <laughs> she did. A, a, just a basic thing that, you know, and we used to share stories about, you know, how Mary <laughs> utilized her trust with, our board members like to always see, uh, you know, the trips and things that, but those are um, opportunities she wouldn't have had otherwise. And these were, um, it, it, they're not funds that are from the general population. It's, you know, her family worked hard and mm -hmm. they wanted to include her, and not just her, but her sister in, you know, their long range plans. Just and like they would have if it was one anybody of those else. three children, Correct. you know, that she would have had that and everything. So why, she she shouldn't be denied it because she, right. she has be to excluded. have this Medicaid el Correct. eligibility and all yeah. too. So um, again, the, the Disability Foundation has a different website than the Brighter Tomorrow. Correct. So can you give that website and give your phone number again? Sure, it's disability-foundation.org. If you don't put the hyphen in there, you get the, Disability Foundation in British Columbia, which I'm sure they do good work. <laughs> they would love your money. <laughs> That's right, and they, but they can't help you. Um, and uh, it's 937-225-9939. Like I said, they can contact me uh, by email too at khade at daytonfoundation.org. Um, like I said, we can provide um, trust, D4C trust services to anyone who is a resident of the state of Ohio and meets the um, definition of having a disability by Social Security standards. And we've talked a little bit about uh, the Dayton Foundation. Boy, where, where would this region be without the Dayton Foundation and all the umbrella things? And we have, uh, through Partners, Partners has an endowment fund mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the Dayton Foundation. And you want to talk a little bit about John Pratt and getting us set up with the uh, Partners Endowment? Well, you know, John Pratt, you know, was he, he's a pioneer for people with disabilities. He was an early founder of Resident Home. He was an early founder of Choices in Community Living. He was a board member for the Montgomery County Board of Developmental Disability Services. And so he, he has been around. He has a daughter that we serve, um, but it, it was more, it wasn't just about serving her. John was about serving everybody that, that had a disability. He was a big hearted man, but he actually helped put us together help put partners together. Um, and he has what we call the John Pratt Legacy Society, where with, under John's name, we've established an endowment at the Dayton Foundation where people can give planned gifts, they can make donations, and it goes to the endowment of partners for community living. Um, and uh, if you knew John, um, you, you would know that you know, that foundation and, and the work that we all do to support people with disabilities was the number one thing in his mind and in his heart. 
and it was because of his generosity that we were actually able to start something like this. And we have to really emphasize the importance of an endowment. I mean, it's one, you know, agencies like Resident Home and Choices and even Brighter Tomorrow when they were starting out, you know, you have to take care of today. That's the priority. You have to make sure people are safe and they're taken care of today. But to be able to have the luxury of beginning to plan for the future, to, to build an investment, to have something there that, you know, if, it, if something catastrophic happens, it could get you through for mm -hmm. a while or something, to be able to be able to just to have that and how important it is to have those endowments and that, um, you know, through plan giving, you know, for uh, certainly for writer tomorrow and for partners endowment or something, whether it's a will or a trust, people can uh, name partners or name uh, brighter tomorrow in their life insurance mm -hmm. policies. Doesn't have to be the whole policy; it can be ten percent right. of the policy. Um, people have done that with retirement funds, a portion of their retirement funds. Um, and I, you know, when I first started talking talking about it, and I was getting in on the ground floor of this, it was like I. You know, I've been in social service all my life. I, I'm not a person that makes a planned gift or, you know, does something right. for a trust or something. But you don't have to be a wealthy person and you don't have to be the CEO of a corporation. You can be a person working in social services that worked with decades for people with developmental disabilities and still right. put money away that, that helps make a difference and all. So, um, and we, you know, we're getting close to the end of the year, uh, another year, and this, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a really good time to, to remind people that certainly we want p families that have a need to come uh, to the Disability Foundation and get in contact with you, but if, if there are people that think that, you know, the work that we're doing is, is good work and that, you know, maybe you would like to be involved in, in ensuring the future for people with disabilities in this community. Um, maybe you'd think at, at the end of the year, call Kevin or call Pete or call Tom and talk about how you might make a gift, a planned gift through your will or a trust. There are trusts that you can even make money on. You know, you can, you can live right. on it and the people. Um, so please consider doing that. It's tax deductible. Um, and it, it makes a difference. So you can contact us at Partners for our Partners Endowment. Give your phone number again. Yep, it's 937-225-9939. Uh, and there is a new program at the state level that's going to be coming about called the ABLE program, and we were going to talk about that a little bit, but I think we have to save that for another program. Okay. Well, we have so much good information in that, but uh, uh, it's uh, A period, B period, L period, E period. So yeah. people could go online and start looking for It's a for federal that. program. Yeah. It's a federal program yeah. that's gone down to the state now Correct. and should take effect in, in January. And that, again, is another big boost for yeah. families and everything. So sure. if you go on and put uh, ABLE Act or ABLE Act in Ohio or something, it will give you more information. Um, uh, thank you, Pete. You're always there, always that steady <laughs> person there for us and always <laughs> such great stories. And Kevin... Yeah, you're a great partner with us, and oh, you know, great. and you're. Uh, uh, one thing I'll say personally with uh, with Kevin is that he's he's always so supportive in us helping us through the applicant. Not that it's a difficult process, right. but through this process and everything. So he is a good person to call. Uh, he he's going to give you the advice and the support you need for any of this information. So uh, I, I think we had a lot of good information. Uh, if if your heart is. Uh, is open to being a part of any of this at any level, we, we do hope you give us a call. Let me give you our phone number, 898-3655, www.partnersohio.com. And with that, we, we will say, let's all have that, uh, that great heart of giving and caring for others, as, especially as we move in into the holiday season and, and that we make our, our community that quality community, that uh, quality of life. Uh, because I know when I give uh, and I support people with developmental disabilities, it just doesn't add quality for, to their life, it adds quality to my life. And until we get a chance to meet again uh, in, in another few weeks or something, think good thoughts and take care of yourself and we'll see you again for Partners for Community Living.